Can everyone um, type in their chat box if you can hear me okay? Give me a yes. That would be helpful. Okay. Just want to make sure everybody's hearing okay. Thank you very much. All right, at this time I'd like to go ahead and read our disclaimer in its entirety. The content shown here is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. We are not lawyers and do not claim to be. You are encouraged to verify any and all parts of this presentation with your own brand's legal counsel. Menutrinfo will not be held responsible for fines or other penalties that arise from recommendations that were made following our best understanding of all published laws and supplemental guidance documents. This webinar contains material protected under international and federal copyright laws and treaties. Any unauthorized reprint or use of any kind of this material is prohibited. No part of this webinar may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic or mechanical, including photocopying, recording, or by any information storage and retrieval system without expressed written permission from the Nutrinfo, the author and publisher. Before we dive into the content of today's webinar, I'd like to share a few words from the sponsor of these great educational webinars. Allertrain is the leading food allergy and gluten-free training program for the food service industry. The Allertrain suite of courses are designed to cater to various food service professionals and settings, including restaurant managers, hourly employees, chefs, university dining halls, university resident advisors, and primary and secondary school staff. Our courses teach food service professionals how to better serve diners with special dietary needs, including food allergies, food intolerances, and celiac disease. Various course delivery options are available, including e-learning, classes taught by our certified master trainers, and via live webinar. Check out our recently updated website at allertrain.com to learn more and sign up for an Allertrain class. Our featured products today are our fabulous Aller cards. As you gather tips and tricks during today's webinar for creating safe, allergen-free, and gluten-free meals, consider ordering these helpful resources for further support. The Aller cards identify alias names for the big eight allergens and gluten, so you know exactly what to look for and avoid when reading ingredient labels. They easily fit into a chef's coat pocket and serve as a convenient reminder when preparing allergen-free or gluten-free meals. These are sold in our online store for only $1.99 each. Get yours today. And with all the housekeeping tasks now behind us, let's go ahead and dive into the content. We have an incredible guest presenter with us today, Chef Amy Fothergill. And before I hand over the reins, let me just tell you a little bit about her. Chef Amy Fothergill studied at Cornell University's School of Hotel Administration. She never thought her culinary skills would be necessary to manage her family's special diet, but has found her cooking knowledge to come in very handy. Her journey began in 2007 when she had to start cooking gluten-free and dairy-free for her own daughter. In order to accomplish this daunting task, she used her training and years of experience in the kitchen to teach herself a new way of cooking. She experimented with the ingredients and techniques necessary for recreating traditional dishes into equally delicious gluten-free and dairy-free versions. Currently, she is a speaker, instructor, consultant, blogger, and writer. She's also the author of the award-winning gluten-free cookbook, The Warm Kitchen, which is about gluten-free recipes anyone can make and everyone will love. She also recently worked with Cornell Dining at Cornell University with their rollout of a 100% gluten-free dining hall. So a big welcome and thanks to Amy for being on the call today. Amy, you now have the floor. Thank you so much. I just wanted to um, say thank you to everybody for our train for having me and thanks for people um, being on the call. Um, I, in that picture, I clearly had too much coffee. I'm kind of laughing <laughs> looking at it. I'm like, woo! <laughs> um, but uh, thank you again and I'm excited to help you out today. Uh, and Lori, if there are any, um, I think we're going to wait to the end for the chat. Is that how we we're going to do it? I just wanted to confirm. If people have questions, we're going to just do those at the end. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay, great. But feel free to put the questions in as you're listening because you might forget later, and then we'll just address them at the end. 
So uh, today what we're going to be uh, talking about is a little bit of what you see on the screen. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about my background. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, what are the top eight, in case you uh, don't know what those are, and a little more information about each of them. I'll discuss what is gluten and where can it be found. We'll talk about gluten-free in the United States and why it's become so prevalent and necessary. I'll discuss how to cook gluten-free, how to bake gluten-free, and how to safely prepare a gluten-free dish in a um, non-dedicated food service kitchen. And then at the end, we'll just make sure that you understood everything and we'll kind of go over it all. And I just hope you find this valuable, so let's uh, get started. Uh, so again, Lori touched on my background. I did go to Cornell, and if uh, people are familiar with at least how it was a number of years ago, it's all about French cooking. So it was butter, sugar, eggs, flour, cream, all the good stuff. And um, I learned also about training, and I had some uh, training, or not training, but I had some education in accounting, uh, and such. So it was kind of a little bit of everything. But I always laugh about, you know, I learned, learned about how to do all the, not the bad things, but all the things that now, of course, I can't use. And uh, following my uh, graduation, I worked in restaurants, worked in catering, I worked in contract food service within healthcare. And then I made a transition into corporate accounting, believe it or not, uh, where during that time, I we went through what was called the uh, an implementation of the accounting software, and I managed to get myself into technology, which brought me out to the West Coast, and I learned how to be a trainer, a writer, a sales consultant, and I always call it my mini MBA. So it was uh, far from food service, but at the same time, I was still using all of my, you know, customer service, uh, you know, the skills that I use, and um, organization and managerial training. When I had my family, I decided to, I really wanted to go back to my passion, which was cooking. So I started to train people or, or you know, teach people how to cook, and I started to uh, write a blog, and everything was going great. And then you know, my daughter was about 13 months old, and things kind of came to a standing halt when the doctor said, oh, she has this eczema on her legs. I want to just want to talk about this because I think it's – important uh the story because everyone's story really leads into where they go and when the doctor said that to me i never ever thought him saying watch that eczema i never thought it would bring me to where i am right now and doing what i'm doing and uh your your passions and what you what you care about can really get you you know lead the path and um i'm happy that i'm doing this because i want to try to help other people so that they don't have to go through as much of it was a very hard process. So um, she had uh, the eczema kept getting worse and worse. The doctor couldn't fix it. The dermatologist, the steroid cream couldn't fix it. She had new allergies, and then finally it was a naturopath, a natural doctor that said she has leaky gut, and um, you might want to sit down because you need to take her off of gluten, dairy, eggs, and about ten other things. And as a mother and as a chef, I was uh, really overwhelmed, even after cooking for the number of years I had. So 10 years ago, there weren't as many resources, and I had to really uh, learn everything. I felt like I was uh, thrown into a new country with a new language. I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know what ingredients to use. So it was a bit devastating. But after I picked myself up and I said, okay, I'm going to figure this out, I started to use my culinary training, and the reason I say that is whether you have to do it, you have to do it for yourself, you have to do it for someone, or you want to do it. Having culinary training really helps because if you understand how food works, if you understand how food's supposed to taste, it's you set as the basis of the product that you're trying to get to, and that's what I continue to do. So if I made a biscuit and it was too dry, I went back and did it again. If I made uh, you know, a breaded chicken tender, and it was soggy. I went back and I did it again, and I just used my culinary training to try different things until I got a product that I thought was suitable to serve to, whether it was my daughter or anyone. Um, <clears throat> so I had to learn, you know, the gluten-free, and to be honest, gluten-free isn't so bad 
<laughs> but when you start adding on uh, dairy-free and uh, egg-free, it starts to get more complicated. But uh, I did figure it out on my own. And about two years into doing that, and I was teaching classes, and I was writing recipes, and the blog started to change, uh, I decided to do something that I didn't expect. I said, oh, I'm just going to... I'm just going to give up gluten for two weeks because there's nothing wrong with me. I just want to see what it's like. I want to understand what it's like to be in the shoes of my customer. I want to see what you have to do when you go out to eat and when you cook at home and when you go to friends' houses. And I I really need to understand what it's like. And that was life-changing for me because within four days, I realized that I actually had a gluten intolerance, and that has led me to a much healthier lifestyle, which has just, again, changed my direction. And I always say... Uh, if I, you know, if I'm mentoring someone or if I'm helping someone, you know, walking in the shoes of the customer is very, uh, it's humbling and it's uh, it's a learning experience because once you have to do it, you look at things very differently. So think about that as a potential way to to learn more yourself. Uh, and again, you depending upon even what the allergen is. So uh, in doing that, I kind of kept developing recipes and having a lot of success and um, becoming more well-known. I live in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and I decided to write a cookbook. And um, in doing that, I've also become a speaker. I travel around the country going mostly to gluten-free and allergen-free expos and talking about how to do it. I um, still teach classes, and I do consulting. So that's a little bit about me, and um, again, I'm happy to be helping today. So let's talk about the top eight allergens. Um, These are the ones that people are most uh, sensitive and allergic to, and again, I'll talk more about the difference between that. But you, um, the things that, I'm sorry, the things that, uh, that are listed are milk, dairy, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, and there is a difference between peanuts and tree nuts. So peanuts are really legume. Tree nuts are things like cashews, walnuts, almonds, etc. cetera. Um, fish and shellfish. So fish being like salmon, tuna, cod, things like that. And shellfish, think of something if it has an outside shell, like a shrimp, lobster, clams, et cetera. Uh, soy is a top allergen, and wheat, uh, gluten. And the reason I, it's listed as wheat is... The eight allergens are what the FDA really looks at, and that is, you'll see something that says it contains wheat, but currently you do not see anything that says it contains gluten, and I'm going to talk about why there's a difference between the two. And in other countries, they actually do distinguish between uh, anything that has gluten, so there's barley and, and different things like that. Um, another common allergen that's not listed is sesame, so it's just one to be aware of. And I thought of another one. Corn is becoming another common allergen. Uh, things to think about with, um, I'm going to look at that very first one with milk. Um, I, I think back in when, you know, probably when I was studying, when we thought of dairy and many, you know, I, I would just ask this kind of generically, when you think of dairy, you might think of, milk and eggs and really there's a difference because where does milk come from milk comes from a cow and where do eggs come from eggs come from chickens generally we're just going to talk generic and we say dairy but most people what they're reacting to it's the casein and the casein is the milk protein so a lactose free milk is still going to have casein um sheep's milk Goat's milk, et cetera, will all have the casein. It's the mil- it's the animal milk protein. So that's what many people will avoid. So you want to make sure you know the difference if someone says they have an allergy or an intolerance, whatever it is, exactly what they're trying to avoid. Because some people can tolerate can't tolerate cow's milk, but they can tolerate goat cheese. So the, there's a difference there. The other thing is that I think is interesting is when I look at these the list of these uh, allergens. I look at how, um, in the United States, how things have changed over the last 50 years, and I see a correlation between the more common allergens and the foods that have been industrialized. So there could be something connected there. Maybe there's not. Um, I guess that's one of the million dollar questions is why are we, why, you know, within society, why are we becoming so allergic and intolerant to foods? I still don't know the answer to that, but 
If you find out, can you let me know, please? <laughs> okay. All right, so let's now talk about common places that we would find these top eight allergens. So again, within milk or dairy, if we just kind of use it generic, you're going to find that in cheese, uh, cream. Even, so here's another interesting one is ghee, and ghee is a clarified butter. There are some people who have an intolerance to milk who can tolerate ghee, and there are some people who can't. So I would say stay away from that if you're thinking of it as an allergy. Whey is a form of uh, dairy. Caramel, obviously, is dairy. And a lot of mixes, and whether we talk about gluten-free, um, things that are you know, ready to go will contain milk that you wouldn't expect. So I would say you, know, you really want to look at labels and understand what's in things. As far as eggs, uh, I've had arguments with people about this because they say, oh, um, you're dairy-free, but I can give you mayonnaise. And they say, no, mayonnaise is dairy. And, and I say, no, well, <laughs> mayonnaise is usually made from eggs and oil and maybe vinegar and salt. So eggs or mayonnaise should be, dairy, it should be dairy-free in the sense it shouldn't have any uh, cow, anything from a cow in there, so just uh, to differentiate. Um, so you'll find, obviously, eggs and mayonnaise, but there are vegan mayos that are available. There are some companies that make vegan mayonnaise. Meringue powder, because it's made from the egg white. It's in a lot of bread, especially gluten-free bread, marshmallows. Even in egg substitutes, sometimes what they're using, or they'll say, oh, it's the egg white and it's not the whole yolk. So it's always important to understand what the food is. Peanuts are obviously going to be in uh, sauces and peanut sauces, peanut oil, and peanut oil could be in the fryer or it could be an ingredient and in many baked goods. Um, again, tree nuts being anything uh, separate from the peanuts. Marzipan is made from almonds. Pesto usually has either pine nuts or walnuts. Obviously, nut oils and walnut oil, um, things of that nature, almond oil, and many other products. So be on the lookout because I feel like these – um, well, and really fish and shellfish, some of these are the really more serious allergens that you want to be super careful about. For fish, you're going to find that in, um, obviously, anchovies, so anything that has an anchovy sauce or anchovies are part of the product. Uh, Worcestershire sauce has fish in it. Imitation crab is made from, from fish, and uh, barbecue sauce can even have fish. Um, shellfish, again, can also be an imitation crab and in fish sauce, so be aware of that. If people are avoiding soy, you'll find uh, soy very often in dairy-free items. So a dairy, if um, you are trying to find something that has a dairy-free substitute and somebody says, oh, I'm gluten-free, dairy-free, and soy-free, some people don't think to look at what is the dairy-free sub. So often it's the tofu or the soy milk. Uh, it might be in vegetarian or vegan items. It's obviously in soybean oil. It's in a lot of sauce, sauces and bases. It's part of usually part of miso. Some miso is made from brown rice. And even tamari. Tamari is um, still soy. And sometimes people will talk about a product called Bragg's, which is a liquid amino, and that's made from soy as well. Um, I like to say with wheat and gluten, how much time do you have? I guess we technically have about 45 minutes, but... Um, there's a lot, and I'm going to go into much more detail. And the reason is uh, that I'm going to talk more about the gluten is the process that I'm going to go through to talk about how to keep gluten out of your kitchen is very similar to the other allergens. So with that, if there's anything else. Um, and also what I wanted to say was uh, gluten and wheat seem to be um, kind of the, the hot topic as well as the most complicated so let's talk about what gluten is. So gluten is the protein that's found in wheat, rye, and barley, and those are three grains. It's actually made up of two proteins, the glutenin and gliadin, and that forms the gluten. Um, and that's important because any of the products, anything that contains wheat, rye, or barley is going to have gluten. I want to talk a little bit about oats because some people assume oats are gluten-free and they're not always, and the reason is there could be uh, contamination of gluten just from being grown next, if oats are grown next to a wheat field, the oats could get contaminated with gluten. If oats are processed in the factory, 
with wheat or barley or rye, they can be contaminated. And then there's a percentage of the population who, even though they are given a certified gluten-free oat, it's so similar in its protein to the to those grains that have gluten, people still react, so they'll say, I can't have oats either. So just be aware that it's uh, one of those that if you can avoid if you're trying to do something gluten-free, you do find there might be a percentage of people who can't have it, unless, of course, you're making oatmeal, but uh, be aware of that. And um, if you're going to use any oats for gluten-free cooking, make sure that they're certified. That's really, really important. And let's talk about then what does gluten-free mean or GF. So you're going to see GF a lot of the time. And it basically means using products that don't have any of these or any part, part of these grains. And understand that because it's part of the food, the gluten cannot be removed. So I get that question a lot of times. People will say, what makes it gluten-free? And really gluten-free means you're using other products, other grains other than wheat, rye, and barley, and maybe oats, or foods that haven't touched any of these foods. Okay, this is one. This is the list, and believe me, the list is longer than this. I uh, just did a um, kind of skimming the surface, but gluten is in all products that are made from flour, from white flour, wheat flour, pasta, crackers, bread, cookies. That's that's almost the easy ones. It's in mixes like cornbread. So sometimes people will think that cornbread is gluten-free because it's made from cornmeal but usually it also always has flour in it. That's why you have to look at the label. Most, uh, a lot of people don't know that soy sauce is fermented with wheat. It's about, it's usually the third ingredient in soy sauce. So this is where if you use a tamari, the tamari is not fermented with wheat, or look for something that says gluten-free tamari. It's also known as gluten-free soy sauce. Um, beer is usually made from barley. It's not always, but I would say 98% of the, maybe even 99% of the beer that is uh, available is probably with gluten. So if you're using beer in um, beer battered fish or if you're using it in a, um, a beef stew, you want to make sure it's gluten-free. And you might have heard of a beer called, or I don't, I don't want to name names, but there are beers that are called gluten because there's not just one of them. They say they are not allowed to be called gluten-free. They say gluten-removed, and those gluten-removed beers are really not safe for celiac. There are some people that will drink it, but just uh, that is what the, the general um, consensus is amongst the community. Again, with the oats, unless it's certified gluten-free, assuming that it's not safe. Um, people have gotten caught up in things like cereal, like uh, your breakfast cereal, so Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes, the, the uh, common brands that you see, usually have malt flavoring. And where does malt come from? Malt comes from barley. So anything, if you see malt, is going to have, um, is going to not be gluten-free. So I usually do it the other way around. I'll say I'll find a rice cereal or a corn flake cereal that says it's gluten-free, and that makes it easier for me. Um, I've had this happen in restaurants uh, two times that I can think of off the top of my head where someone has sworn to me up and down that it was gluten-free. And I said, but the what about the imitation crab? And they look at me with their head to the side. What do you mean if you look at the ingredients of most of the imitation crab? There's like one company now that makes a gluten-free imitation crab. The third ingredient is usually wheat starch. So then it's not uh, gluten-free. So it's usually used for California rolls would be a good example. And we talked about malt flavoring, so malt vinegar or anything with the um, anything malt anything. Um, you know, it's in sometimes sweets. It's in malted milk. Um, malt vinegar is used a lot of times for seasoning. There's other vinegars you can use. You find uh, you can find gluten in sauces and gravies, bases, even manufactured broth. It hides in very strange places. So um, I've. It's just over the last 10 years, I've been amazed at places I've found gluten. So don't assume just because, oh, it's just chicken broth. Oh, it's just a plain sauce. It won't have it. It might. Um, and that, again, another one for personal experience I found are frozen French fries or even or sweet potato fries. Sometimes we'll have a coating, and that might be a, a wheat-based coating. Um, meat substitutes will often have 
uh, be made from meat, so seitan is one of those that's actually made from wheat gluten. And I'll ask this question, sort of uh, put it out there, and you, we can talk about it later. If, have you found it? Have you found gluten anywhere else that you didn't expect? I find I found it. I found it in veggie sticks. I found it in. Um, I went to a restaurant uh, once, and it was in risotto. And I thought they put they added it in to make it thicker, and I was very surprised by that. So, I'm just curious if you have any other um, people have any anecdotes, please share them. Okay, and there's still more. I thought we were done, but now there's still more. Uh, you can find gluten in cornmeal, believe it or not, that's processed on shared equipment or in the same facility. Uh, bulk food, so this is if you were going to the grocery store and you just needed to grab some walnuts or grab maybe some sugar. Most of the bulk food companies will have a disclaimer saying that there can be wheat because it's in that shared environment and it could fall from one bin to the other. So the recommendation is to not use bulk food if you want to uh, cook gluten-free. It can also be fine in spices or spice mixes, which is I think surprises people. It's not saying it's always going to be there, but this is, again, another reason to look for a, a certified gluten-free um, natural flavoring, flavorings, caramel color, and more. It's The list is pretty long. But allergen cards, I think I was looking at them earlier, are uh, very good because they do have listed many, many of the items for gluten and for those other allergens that you might find. Um, so I'm just trying to think what else. Oh, okay, and the bottom line is really what you want to do you want to research the ingredient itself, make sure you understand it. You want to check with the manufacturer and make sure that they are not producing the item that you're buying in a shared facility. And uh, just to make sure you understand the uh, ingredients themselves and you know, see, you know, again, it could be in things that you're not expecting. So it becomes uh, really down to sourcing, and we're going to talk more about sourcing in a couple minutes. Um, cross, uh, let's see. Oh, in the, oh, in the last, sorry, in the last bit. So it was manufacturer, um, check to see if it's certified. And if you're not sure if it's certified, the last thing, and then we're going to talk more about that, is testing. And we'll talk about how to do testing. So if you have some cornmeal and you can't find certified gluten-free cornmeal, if you're testing on a regular basis, that may be sufficient, and we'll discuss that. Um, let's talk about cross-contact because uh, this does apply to the other allergens as well. And I will tell you that in the what I call civilians, people who are um, just your uh, customers, they will refer to it as cross-contamination. And in food service, we think of cross-contamination as raw products or you know, raw chicken, raw meats, and so forth. So we know it's cross-contact, but they might refer to it as cross-contamination. These are places that gluten can be found are uh, cutting boards and knives, serving utensils, the toaster. A lot of people will uh, try their best and say, oh, we have gluten-free bread, and then they'll put it in the toaster where the, they toast regular bread, and the crumbs can still be in the toaster itself. This is another common one that I've personally had issues with is the pasta water or the colander. Uh, the the same water is used for the gluten pasta and the gluten-free pasta. That really doesn't work. And the colander, it may not be clean. It might be picking up um, gluten within the, you know, the, the colander strainer itself. Uh, another one that I see a lot of times is the fryer, and I'll ask if the fryer is dedicated. Um, if you are frying anything that has gluten, a chicken tender, an onion ring, uh, anything in the oil, that oil is not gluten free. And if uh, I had, you know, it was a couple of years ago, I ordered, I said, oh, are the French fries gluten free? Yes, they are. They told me up and down, I, yes, they're the chef says they are. I found an onion ring, and not even bef before anything, I, I found an onion ring actually in with the french fries, and I went back and I said, I thought you said they were gluten free. And the, pers the cashier said to me, oh, the chef says when you fry it at such a high temperature that the gluten gets um, that there's no gluten anymore, and then it gets killed off. And unfortunately, that's not the that's not the case. So it's not like a bacteria that can just be 
um, sanitized off, it has to really just, there just can't be any in it because you can't see the small, small particles. So fryers are a big one. Um, bins. So I know that we're supposed to take a clean cup every time we measure something, but it's possible that someone might scoop flour and then put that scoop into a bowl, and they may take the same scoop or measuring cup and scoop it into the sugar, and guess what? Now that sugar is contaminated. So it's really important uh, for training, making sure things are kept separate, that that doesn't happen. A convection oven is another place where you can find gluten because if you're making something that, uh, you know, rolls and there's flour and the flour is flying around the oven and then you put a gluten-free muffin in there, uh, after, you know, right after that gluten can land on the muffin and then make the muffin not gluten-free. Um, and again, anything in the air, if you're using flour, uh, pizza restaurant, bakery, it's going to be really hard to keep the items gluten-free. So I'm going to talk more about later how you can avoid that. Um, but one, one restaurant that I go to, I bring my family, what they do is they use rice flour to roll out the regular pizza and by doing that, it keeps flour to a minimum, and they can keep the gluten-free pizza separate, and they have a separate oven as well, and they can keep the gluten-free pizza safe. So there are workarounds, uh, and, and they have not had any complaints. People don't even know that they're using the rice flour for the regular for the pizza. Okay. So, again, uh, what it comes down to is sourcing is really important, and also products can change. Um, you want to be working with your suppliers and checking your labels, and that's uh, and, and this is within any of the allergens. This is uh, applicable. So let's talk a little bit about sourcing tips. Um, you want to ensure that the desired products are available. Uh, best choice is using a food supply vendor as opposed to a grocery store. You want to make sure that the vendor has liability insurance, and it will cover you in case you thought that you know there was an issue with the product that you thought it was gluten-free or you thought it was nut-free, and grocery stores don't offer this. So just be aware of that. And then when you find the product, you want to do research. You want to see you know, what else are they producing, where they're making the gluten-free flour, or maybe the, uh, whatever it happens to be. So with Bob's, they have plants that are gluten-free, but they may also have soy or the peanuts or tree nuts, whatever it might be. So you might have one company that's 100% gluten-free, but then, again, it's not, um, you're trying to maybe do dairy-free, and they have dairy, so just be aware of that. And one thing is that once you find a product that you might want to use, you want to make sure to get a sample to ensure that it reacts the way you expect it, and this happens more with, say, a dairy-free or gluten-free um, as opposed to, I would think, nut-free. Okay, let's talk about the prevalence of gluten-free in the U.S. and why it's becoming such an issue and why it's becoming so prevalent. So I said earlier that uh, our family has been gluten-free for 10 years, and about five years ago I started to see, I started to see the, what was coming down the pike. I started seeing more and more people telling me that they'd either been diagnosed or that they were feeling better, whatever the case was. Um, Based on the numbers and based on the research, uh, they're saying that um, what's out there right now is saying that 1% one, one percent of the population has celiac disease, and of the 1%, if you take all the people that have it, 83% do not know that they have it. So that means that those people are going to be diagnosed hopefully over the next 5 to 10 years and um, hopefully will limit their suffering. Uh, and that is really... Um, uh, really important. I've had the chef say to me, oh, gluten-free is just a fad, it's just a trend, but it, it really isn't. And what celiac disease is, it's, a, um, it's basically an attack to your immune system, and it's an autoimmune disease. It's generally, uh, it's all inherited, so you, um, the genes are inherited. Whether or not you get it, it depends on, you know, you could have just a bad luck of the draw, you uh so it depends on what you eat. It depends on your health and things like that. One thing to note is that many people who are gluten-free for whatever reason are also dairy-free or, as I said, casein-free. So keep that in mind when you're doing recipe development. Um, 
What I think the reason, you know, I think that there are more celiac disease cases being diagnosed is there are two reasons. One is the doctors are becoming more educated. So uh, about if you ask a doctor and you ask them what did they know about celiac disease 10 or 15 years ago, they knew that, oh, if somebody came in with certain um, symptoms, uh, diarrhea, very small, skinny, abdominal pain, <laughs> they might have tied it to celiac disease. They may or may, or may not have. And celiac disease has about 200 symptoms. It my my daughter is hers is all skin. She has no stomach. My son is mild stomach and canker sores. It can change. It can vary in people. So a lot of people don't even know that it's an issue. So you get the doctors learning more, and they're starting to diagnose. And then part of what sets off celiac disease is if you have a compromised immune system, your body. Might, it might set off, and if you know the between the American diet and the food supply isn't as clean as it was when maybe our grandparents were alive or great grandparents, that can all lead to more cases of celiac disease. So um, I would suggest googling what is celiac disease to understand it better, and uh, I have some resources at the end so you'll know what that is. Um, functional medicine has identified gluten as a health risk. So that means that, you know, you'll see people who are just gluten-free because they um, think it's better for them. Uh, I think it's funny that, you know, people say I'm gluten-free, but you don't hear people come in and saying, I think I'm going to be peanut-free. I'm going to be almond-free. So there are some people who do it and maybe don't know all the, uh, you know, the reasons why, but and they may or may not feel better. And some people just think it's healthier, and when I say it's not necessarily true, what that means is if you eat a gluten-free diet and you're eating gluten-free donuts and gluten-free bread, it's not probably going to change your health. But if you eat a gluten-free diet and you start eating more vegetables and lean meats and healthy fats, it could potentially change how you feel. And then you have people who are paleo, and paleo is really just um, meats, it's uh, meats, vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds, healthy fats. It's no grains, no sugar, no soy, things like that. So you have people eating paleo who either want to be more fit or for medical reasons. And I would say, you know, really it's two choices. If you want to ignore it, that's fine. But to be honest, I think your customers and your future customers are those who are going to be uh, want some gluten-free options and safe gluten-free options. So... To make a dish truly gluten-free, think of gluten or really any allergen as raw chicken, and that's the best way to go about it. And what does that mean? So if you think of a piece of bread or tortilla, uh, flour in the kitchen, crumbs that fell from something, pasta, if that's the raw chicken, think of the pan. And as I'm going through these, think about how would you do it different? So has that pan touched raw chicken before being clean? What would be the answer? you always make sure you have a clean pan, okay? The grill or the wok, has a, has the griddle been cleaned before I put something on there that needs to be gluten-free? If it hasn't, it potentially could have gluten. The fryer, we talked about that. Is it in the sauce? And that could be from two ways. It could be in the sauce itself if you didn't make it, if it has some ingredients that possibly are in there, or if I have, I'm making pizza and I have a ladle and I scoop out the ladle and I put it onto a gluten pizza crust and then I use that same label and that same sauce and I put that onto a gluten-free pizza crust, guess what happens? That gluten-free pizza is no longer gluten-free. Is it on the meat? Is it in the rice? Is it in the vegetable, the tongs, the spatula, the spoon? Um, how about the salt and pepper I use for seasoning? I mean, to be honest, a lot of us use our hands in the kitchen, even if you use gloves and if you're Grabbing the seasonings and you just touch something with gluten, now the seasoning is no longer gluten-free. Um, even my hands or the gloves, if I grabbed a roll, if I grabbed the tortilla and then I grabbed something else, you can actually get cross-contact just from that. Um, think about the dish itself. Has there been any gluten on it or even the garnish? And really, at the end of the day, if you're not sure, you shouldn't take a risk uh, and you just don't just – Start over, and I'm, people who are truly gluten-free will understand if there's been a mistake and you have to redo. They don't want to get sick. So let's talk about how to convert your dishes to gluten-free. 
Uh, for substitutions, you can, uh, for your gluten free pasta, again, it must be cooked in separate water with separate tongs and a strainer. For uh, gluten free flour, and I like to use gluten free flours without a gum, and that mean, that's either xanthan gum or guar gum. Uh, you're gonna, you can actually use that to sub for a roux, so you would make it the same way. Or you could use a cornstarch slurry to thicken. But if you're doing a slurry, you want to make sure that you're adding fat, maybe butter or a plain coconut oil, so that you get some more texture. And let me go back to the gluten-free pastas. There are many that are on the market. Uh, you have to really test them to see what you like best. Most of them don't need as much cooking time as it says, and if you continue to stir the pasta after it's cooked, it will fall apart. I like to cook my pasta and then shock, uh, shock it, make it cold, and then reheat it for um, for whenever I need it. That's you know, I kind of I will undercook a little and then just reheat it as I need it. Uh, let's go back to the gluten-free flour and then floured items. So if you just have to flour a chicken breast or maybe flour a vegetable, whatever it might be, you can use a one-to-one -one ratio of potato starch to white rice flour. So a tablespoon, a tablespoon, a cup to a cup, and that will act as your flour or any of the gluten-free flours for that gum. For breading, you can make um, breading from gluten-free corn flakes that have been crushed up gluten-free brown rice cereal that have been crushed, uh, toasted gluten-free bread that's been toasted and then chopped, potato chips, as long as you're gluten-free, or any type of gluten-free breadcrumbs. And the availability of these products are, is so much more than what it used to be. They're much, much better. So you have a lot of more options. For the binding, so if you're binding for meatloaf, meat, uh, meatballs, anything like that, you can so use a plain gluten-free cereal, like either the cornflake or the brown rice, a gluten-free bread that's been maybe soaked, or gluten-free breadcrumbs. And sometimes I don't even put any breading in there. I will just do the egg and the meat and vegetables along with uh, the, the meat itself, and it doesn't even need the um, bread to hold it together. The eggs work really well. And then another one that I want to mention is using... Um, uh, battering. So if you wanted to do a fried chicken, you can actually use either super fine white rice flour or a combination of uh, a gluten-free, again, a gluten-free flour one. I prefer the ones without the gum that have um, gluten-free grain with a gluten-free starch combined, usually about a, you know, two parts of the grain to one part of the starch. It, I've been finding more and more restaurants that are doing 100% gluten-free fried foods. I was just in Atlanta, and it was a, there's a, a small chain of restaurants, and they make gluten-free chicken, uh, fried chicken, fried okra, fried uh, jalapenos, and they just use the same batter for everything. So if someone is uh, gluten-free, their head over heels are so excited, and for those who are not gluten-free, it's very hard to tell the difference. So sometimes you can just switch something over and your customers you know, may or may not notice. Uh, thinking of other items like lasagna, you can also think outside the box a little bit. You can make a lasagna from polenta slices. And again, you want to make sure that that polenta is uh, gluten-free. You could do it from sliced vegetables like zucchini or eggplant, or you can use gluten-free noodles. Um, most of the gluten-free noodles I've seen will say that they don't need to be boiled, but realize that the sauce itself that you're using must be thin because if you're going to take a hard noodle and you're expecting it to be soft when it's done baking, you need to have some moisture in there and make sure it's covered, of course. If you uh, have a recipe that has soy sauce or you use soy sauce, you can use tamari. And again, I've seen restaurants that just do 100%, just do the substitution. That way... Uh, Everything is always gluten-free, save for any of the marinades, um, maybe appetizers. And then if somebody needs soy-free, there's a product called Coconut Aminos, and that's a good soy-free substitute. Um, here's a real easy one. If you are trying to figure out how to make something gluten-free, foods that don't have gluten are unmarinated meats, fish, and seafood, vegetables, raw potatoes, fruits, and plain vegetable oils. And what that means is if you're trying to come up with a menu item that's gluten-free and maybe some of this is intimidating with all looking at all these ingredients, just give people real food, real 
you know, unprocessed food, and that would be gluten-free as long as you have an, you know, the cross contact and such. We don't have any issues there. Um, foods that could have gluten is anything that's processed. There's, again, the spices, the sauces, the marinades, and the grains themselves, so be aware of that. So for baking, you can use a gluten-free flour mix with gum. Uh, you want to use the gum that helps hold it together. Uh, on my website, which was at the beginning of the presentation, and I think I'll have it at the end, I have a recipe for one that I like to use, or you can use commercial ones. You want to look for recipes that are solid, meaning that have been tested, uh, that um, other people may have used, and you want to test those in your kitchen. And not every recipe can be converted one-to-one -one with gluten-free. So things like pizza and breads, you can't just take a gluten-free flour and change it over. But easy things like pancakes, waffles, muffins, quick breads, those, a lot of the cookies, those actually you can just use the flour and just uh, substitute one-to-one. -one. But if you're making any of these items, what's important for the cross-contact is to make sure that it's a dedicated pan, dedicated waffle maker or crate pan, whatever the case may be. Um, breads can be made. Gluten -free, a good gluten-free bread can be made with the right recipe. It can be mixed in a bowl with a spatula, and you can just let it rise in the pan. It's not as hard as it seems. It's just different ingredients and a different feel of the batter, and the dough feels much more sticky. So once you get used to that, it's actually um, very doable in the kitchen. You want to make sure you're always using proper baking techniques and measuring that you're shortening and your butter is cold if you're making a pie crust, that you... Uh, when you measure flour, you're either weighing it or you're making sure that it's flat and not packed down. You want to use parchment paper for anything baked because it's so sticky so it doesn't stick to your pan. And what I found works really well is using what's called a touch test for doneness. So instead of sticking a toothpick, if you press on it, it should bounce back when it's finished baking. So serving gluten-free food that's safe and food service you want to think about the requirements, um, the labels of the food, make sure your processes are documented, uh, training to the staff, and make sure the food itself is labeled within the kitchen. You always want to start with clean cutting boards, knives, bowls, um, dedicated as preferred. It's going to make your customers feel a lot better, uh, whether they're labeled, whether it's colored, whatever the case may be. The area where the prep is done should be washed with new towels before starting. So again, think of it as if, was there raw chicken there? Could there have been raw chicken there? Get out the you know, brand new towel, get everything sanitized, everything wiped down, and then start prepping. Uh, again, if it's separate, a separate area is always better. Make sure the ingredients have been stored safely. So you don't want to store the flour over the sugar, the sugar you know, regular flour over the sugar you're going to use. Um, make sure you start with new gloves. Um, if uh, you're prepping your gluten-free ingredients, make sure they're covered. Top shelf if you can in the, in the walk-ins, uh, covered, labeled, and proper storage. And think about where it's going to be cooked. Separate pan, separate oven is always best. So this is part of the process of if you're ready to do gluten-free food in your kitchen, you, get a, you have to think about it from the time it comes in the kitchen all the way to the time it gets to the customer. When the item is ordered, what's going to happen? What does the front of house have to communicate to the back of the house? Will this item always be gluten-free because of how it's made so that you don't have to do that? That might be an easy way to do it. Maybe it's always the, uh, you know, again, the teriyaki marinade now is always made with the gluten-free soy sauce. Uh, it's always, you know, the grill always has gluten-free items. And if it's made gluten-free and if, say, if it's the pasta, the, the dessert, or the fried food, consider a label or a flag or something to indicate that you made sure it was gluten-free. So some restaurants will do that. They'll have little stickers so that they know someone in the kitchen took special care for that. Other things to consider, testing. So there's different testers you can get. There's the Gluten Tox Pro Swab Test, or there's what's called a NEMA sensor, and that tests, um, currently it's testing for gluten, and it will show if there's 20 parts per million or more, and 20 parts per million is um, like a crumb of a crumb. It's a really, really small amount. And uh, the NEMA devices also will be also able to detect if there's peanuts. They're going to come out with peanuts and milk and other allergens later. You want to make sure training, 
top down, everyone knows what to do. Um, have your policies and procedures documented. Some companies will just say we want one person to execute the dish, whether it's the chef, it's a manager. Those are some things that have worked. Uh, communication on the menu in front of house is really important. Uh, making sure that you know if it truly is gluten free, you know, describing what it is and such. Um, and I think this is important. You want to just make sure that you're honest with what you can and you can't do. If you can't deliver and make something gluten-free, then you need to tell your customers that. Uh, you know, a pizza restaurant or a bakery where flour is flying around, you may not be able to ever make something that's gluten-free. Can you bring something in from another company that's gluten-free and reheat it, cover it? Yes, that's an option. Can you do it first thing in the morning? It may or may not work, so that's where you have to do testing. So maybe putting a disclaimer in there so that people are aware and then let them make their decisions. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to leave this up for a minute because this will be uh, on the presentation and you can come back and look at this. So these are companies that offer test kits. And okay, sorry, Lori, I did it. <laughs> so the things we talked about is uh, hopefully after seeing all this, you should be able to explain what gluten is and know in which of the major foods it can be found. Hopefully you can describe some of the reasons why people need to eat gluten-free because there's really many. Um, you should be able to list some of the ingredients which can be used to make a dish gluten-free, so some of the substitutions. Understand how to prevent cross-contact and uh, know where to get more information about celiac disease and the needs of gluten-free customers. So if you want to get more information and to get a discounted copy of, the, of my book, you can go to my website. It's amy, amythefamilychef.com, so that's the main website. And then you have to type in gluten-free resources and then gluten-free resources for chefs. So it's sort of a... Um, hidden page, so I don't have it available for everyone, but it will have information about where to get information about celiac disease, and it has the link to the book and such. And if you just want to send me a question or get in touch with me about consulting, that is my uh, personal email. And oh my gosh, Lori, I think I did it, so <laughs> I'll hand the reins back over to you. Thank you so much, Amy. You did a great job. Um, before we get to question and answer time, I, I do want to encourage you guys, if you have any last minute questions that come to mind, please type those in the chat box and we will address them. Um, before we do, we want to just share our next webinar topic with you. Coming your way June 27th is another important webinar entitled Be, Be Supplier Savvy. Join us to learn how the right distributor can make or break your menu labeling efforts. Topics will um, include nutritional differences in products, allergen differences, cross-contact in manufacturing, and menu labeling certification. This webinar will be led by our Director of Education, Ms. Claire Willis, so we hope you'll join us for that. And like every webinar in our 2017 educational series, this webinar is approved for one continuing education unit that's at level two through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. A registration link to next month's webinar will be found in the email you receive after today's call, along with a survey that we would kindly ask you to fill out. Your feedback is always valuable to us. And for those of you on the call who are interested in receiving those continuing education credits from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the post-meeting email will also contain a completed proof of attendance that you can simply download and submit to the Academy to redeem those hours. And finally, we want to let you know about how to become a master trainer and a special discount we have going on right now. Thanks, Lori. This is Leslie from the Aller Train team. Just letting you all know that we are offering a spring discount on our upcoming master trainer webinar. Um, that'll be 10% off of the tuition price. So if you've been thinking about and wanting to be the food allergy trainer for your brand or university, now is a great time to become a master trainer. Um, just visit allertrain.com to register under the Master Trainer tab. And as always, if you have questions, email us at aller at menutrinfo.com or call 888-767-6368. All right, now we'd like to go ahead and answer uh, the questions we have received. There's just a couple. Um, one person asked if we could show the test resource list slide again. So if we want to... Amy, do you want to, want to go back? Sure, yeah. 
Um, I can do it. Let's see. Okay, thanks. And I yep. also wanted to mention that just so that people understood initially when we were doing uh, setting up this call as far as who does what, that you know, if you're looking for the training, so you know, our train does the training, and then you have kitchens with confidence. So Jeff was supposed to be on the call, this wasn't be able, able, able to make it. They do the auditing and they do the certification. So it, if you are interested in you know, you get trained, it's a really good idea to also get certified because it gives confidence to the customers that you have taken the steps. There are many food service kitchens that will say they serve gluten-free and it's really not safe or whatever the allergen is. And it's a really serious thing. Um, you will, you know, if I, there are a number of restaurants we've been to where we have found gluten, whether we react or we found it through one of the devices and what happens is now I'm not going to go back to that restaurant, but the restaurants that show me they've done training and they've gotten certified, it makes a really big difference. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Amy. Yeah, if anyone is interested in getting their kitchen audited, um, check out kitchenswithconfidence.com for more info there. Um, the one other question we had um, was, when gluten or wheat is in natural flavorings, is the label legally required to indicate this in the advisory statement? Um, and I'd be happy to answer that. If you yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just going to say, I mean, the big eight allergens are required to be listed on an ingredient label in the U.S. Um, so if, if the ingredient is derived from wheat, then it is required to be on there. But if it's from barley, rye, or any other gluten source, then it's not required to be called out since those aren't, you know, one of the big eight allergens themselves. Yeah, and it's, it hasn't changed yet, but that unfortunately is, is true, and that's why you want to look for something that says gluten-free because the, the manufacturer, the food manufacturers, if it's, if they put on a label that says it's gluten-free, that means that there's at least um, that you know, there's 20 parts per million or less of gluten in there, which is found to be an acceptable amount. For some people, it's actually not. Uh, and the uh, they really should be getting um, they should be the way that the FDA wrote the the law was that a company should be doing their own steps to make sure that it's that it's actually gluten free. So. Mm -hmm. But the certification, if it says certified gluten-free, that's always safest because that means somebody went the extra, you know, the extra mile to do the testing as well. Sure. Well, that's actually the, the only other question we have. Um, do you have any closing remarks, Amy? We're right on time here. Oh, good. <laughs> I, started, I don't know if you noticed, but I started to go fast toward the end because I wanted to make sure I got everything in. Uh, I, I think that... What I'd like to close with is, if you're on the call, if you're you know, you're on the call because you want to try to do this within food service, I really encourage you. As I said, it's it's very important to do it right, and uh, doing it wrong is uh, you know will cost you in the long run. And there are other companies who are doing it right. So if you look at this, and it seems like a daunting task. Disney is doing a great job, and that's any of the Disney areas, whether it's California, Orlando, their cruise lines, they're really, um, they take it very, very seriously. Uh, some of the restaurant chains, um, P.F. Chang's has gotten better. I'm still finding that some people are saying they've had some reactions, but they've, they've come a long way. Uh, the other one I was thinking of was the counter. They keep... Um, everything very separate. Uh, then you have companies like, you know, Bob's who are now doing a lot of labeling. Um, and also when it comes to finding the gluten-free products, there are so many more products. So if you wanted to carry a gluten-free bread, a gluten-free um, bagel, whatever the case is, I would say to do your research because uh, people may look to always the more popular ones but there are a lot of uh, smaller brands that are out there that really do a very, very good job. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Amy. We appreciate your time and your expertise here. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on today's call.